an owner of Anthem Mills in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, where they um, mill uh, different uh, organic heirloom grains, and they, they also do other specialty uh, mill products down there as well. And I've known Glenn for a number of years, and I think uh, I think he was the first person, or at least one of the first people, to start really promoting the value of these um, heirloom um, varieties, um, you know, for their flavor and also the history, and talk about the importance of bringing these varieties back. And now it's just like a super hot thing, like all the top chefs are, are using them, in these different varieties. So I think um, Glenn's had a lot to do with that. The other great thing I think that Glenn has done is he's uh, worked with farmers to get them interested in organic um, heirloom grain production and work with them to help them on the production side, which is really, you know, help create opportunities for the farmers, but also increase the availability and also the seed availability for, you know, folks that are interested in growing them. So with that introduction, I'll let Glenn <laughs> talk about everything else. So please tell me about Oh, yeah. Hi, y'all. It was really great to be here. Take care. Oh, right. I just got here, right? Um, I live on an airplane like Dr. Kresovich, right? Or a rental car like Dr. Kresovich. And there was a lot of nice stuff that Jeff just said right then, but honestly, um, <laughs> it was the scientists at Clemson. Uh, university, I can remember my first exchange with Dr. Merle Shepard, let me make sure that's turned off, um, uh, when he was director of Clemson Coastal Research and Education Center. Um, and I wouldn't be growing rice now had it not been for Merle. Uh, and why was Merle growing rice? I mean, Clemson Coastal Research and Education Center is uh, allied with the U.S. Federal Vegetable Laboratory. Uh, and the word vegetables in there, where do you get rice and vegetables? It's a cover crop. It's just underwater, so let's do some underwater vegetables. So they, they were actually running some routines on, I don't know, watercress or something. But <laughs> the bottom line was the first successful rice field I saw was on Clemson University property. It, it, I'd like to be romantic and say I had an epiphany. And I went across the river from Savannah with the Schultz family who had a rice field. But the word success, I don't think even Dr. Richard Schultz Sr., who, who did that with his wife starting in 1983, would say it was a success. By the time I saw the rice field, they had diseased up so badly that they were down to about 200 pounds an acre. Carolina Gold Rice is supposed to get a half ton, 1,000 pounds an acre or so. And they had started out quite robustly, and they'd moved up to 30 acres of production, and they were getting 30 times 200. Uh, and Dick had paid for every bit of it, and he was giving the rice away. It wasn't a commercial project. And about the same time, uh, a guy named Powers across the river, who's related to Campbell Cox of Carolina Plantation Rice, put in his first crop, and he had a very successful 40-acre field of, uh, I think it was Della back in the day. Uh, it's an aromatic, long-grain, um, hybrid, modern, dwarf rice, uh, pretty high yielder, and he yielded very well with it. And so I saw those two efforts. I didn't, had not yet met Campbell Cox, the owner of Carolina Plantation Rice, who was a successful rice grower. Um, but I went to, because I lived in Charleston, I went to see Merle Shepard. Somebody told me he had rice out there. I thought, oh, well, he has a little plot. He's a scientist, right? Uh-uh. He had like a three-acre field and another three-acre field. That's a lot of rice. And both of those fields were netted against rice birds, rice birds that decimated most, up to 40, 50, 70 percent of rice crops. They got so far out of hand during the heyday of rice, 112,000 acres from... Fernandina Beach all the way up to Wilmington uh, amidst millions of acres of wilderness and other farming. The rice birds were so prevalent that they were taking a major portion of the crop. And um, the best bounty for hunting was rice birds, especially if you're using small gauge. You used to use great big gauge guns for them too. So got any hunters in here? That used to be the number one bounty. You can make some big bucks shooting rice birds. 
and they're tasty. Anybody ever eaten one? You're not supposed to. Right? You got a depredation permit, you know, red winged blackbird, kind of related to the bobolink. Yeah, you hold on to the beak and the tongue, eat it like corn on the cob, right? <laughs> they're small, but they eat a lot of rice. Anyhow, like rice? rice birds do taste like rice. So do rice pigs. You know, we do rice hogs. Um, down at the uh, uh, quail company, Tony is a graduate from here who owns it and runs it. So Tony Barnes? Um, yeah. Um, the, Brittany Miller is the owner of Manchester Quail. We've done feed programs with rice, and she can tell us the difference, and so can I. And she occasionally gets requests, and we send her rice, and she feeds out and sells those quails as rice quail. And uh, pigeons at the Palmetto Pigeon Plant. Um, Tony has done three or four feeding routines making squab, right, uh, fed with rice. We've done rice pigs, uh, and we have in Texas where we farm a lot of rice. We have 1,600 acres total down there, uh, 290 acres in seed in the net in organic production. By the way, half of the seed is organic too. So how many people in here are interested in sustainability? Everybody? Okay. Uh, for those of you, how many people in here know about how difficult it is to do true type replication in seed routines? So you cheated. You have a postdoc degree. No, you worked all over the world. No, you work in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. Uh, yes. And Dr. Kresovich will be speaking next week, and I would like to come back for that. Right? I feel kind of weird. Their minds <laughs> so you can correct it. Right. Ah, you know how it works in politics, fact check? Hey, we're there. <laughs> and you, this is the best fact check you're going to get. Uh, I think Dr. Kresovich would agree that trying to do organic seed production is difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. It requires a lot more hand labor, a lot more machining. The diesel imprint, if you look at it, start to stop. I think probably is not even as efficient as chemical seed production, but we're doing half of it anyhow. And we're not tracking, since we don't have to be peer-reviewed, right, I just refuse to, I'm uneducated. I, I don't even know if I went to college because I think I was drinking too much, right? I have a degree and it's in music and chemistry, but I don't do either thing right now except listen. So uh, I'm not so sure that I am applying any education to what I do, but we do half of our Carolina rice seed production sustainably now. And we actually, if we cut it ourselves, we can certify that certified organic seed. We haven't done it, but we can. And next week we're going to, and it hasn't, to my knowledge, I don't think anybody's doing certified organic rice seed, but Dr. Kresovich may check that and tell you whether I'm right. Uh, it's hard. It involves roguing. Anybody know what that is? Have to sweep. Look at every plant. Ah, you know. Stew flavor. And you got to carry this stuff off the field, display it, and log it. Do tax morph on it, too. What is it? Why is it? And how much you get? Right? It's not easy. Twelve guys, 105 degrees outside, 99% humidity under the canopy, and you see people wrestling under the canopy, these big old, old, old rices, and they're, like, looking for off types. That's a hard job. I have done that. I'm rotten at it. I also learned how to walk in rice, by the way. Did you know there's a way? Steve, is this, have you ever even heard this? There's a way to walk in rice? You wiggle your foot? Yeah, see, I don't know anything. I just got taught that by... Did you? I got yelled at horribly this spring. You don't know how to walk in rice? I said, yeah. And they said, uh-uh, not in my field, right? So and learn how to wiggle your foot. I think somebody ought to make a dance out. I'm sure they have. Right, but it's really pretty to watch somebody that's good at it. Is that where shagging came from? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I don't know. Okay, so I guess the first question I get all the time, do I farm? Yes, I farm myself. Do I farm like a ton of stoop labor like I used to because we're almost 20 years in? The answer is no. I don't have time anymore. We're uh, chasing uh, farmers trying to get support to them. Why do I do this? Because... The Carolina Rice Kitchen um, has an entire canon of farm crops that are associated with rice export. Uh, there's good and bad. Slavery is right there smacking in the face. If you're doing the labor, 
you can appreciate what that means. And I have to tell you, I don't feel super guilty about being a face-to-face white guy in my rice fields. It's hard. <laughs> so when you're doing the Carolina rice kitchen, you never forget that we had an entire 112,000-acre rice system where no one got paid to make it. It's uh, Jonathan Green calls it the largest human sculpture in the history of the world, bigger than the pyramids, bigger than the Great Wall of China, and it was all done free. That was weird. So, but it's extraordinary. Anybody flown over them, hunted in them, down there on the coast, the Ace Basin? It's gorgeous down there. You talk about the terraform, turning all that yeah. white and swamp land into So it's a totally synthetic environment for a hundred and some miles. Two hundred if you count the smaller fields. We're green gardens about two thousand, I think. Yeah. Exactly. And so those of you who have been out there can attest when you step out of your vehicle without a weapon you are stepping back in time because you can indeed be eaten, killed, lost, whatever. It's wild. The rice fields are abandoned pretty much. They're gorgeous, and you can see the berms, but I bet you if we're farming 3% of the originals, I'd be surprised. They're very difficult to farm because you can salt up, which calls for a whole nother rotation of foods. Uh, so I'll stop there and say this was a massive exercise based on free labor with inequities that we can't imagine, honestly, in this day and time, I don't think, which actually created a world cuisine. It was the first one that went worldwide from here. And it was the cuisine, since I built hotels and restaurants for 30-some years prior, I don't know how I became a rice farmer out of that, but it was the cuisine that got me there. The farming aspect, not farm to table, but table to farm, because there was no farming. Uh, David Shields, who's a, a historian and president of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation, which Dr. Krasovich is a member of the board, uh, said something pretty powerful just lately. He got an award last week. And what he said was, it was the food, because I love flavor, that attracted me to the idea of trying to discover what we lost and don't have. When I came here, it was Merle Shepard working on experimental rice and Dr. Richard Schultz. No one else was growing Carolina Gold Rice anywhere in the United States. I thought we should grow Carolina Gold Rice, and the first thing I found out was that Carolina Gold Rice yields about one-tenth of normal rices in high chemical production. How do you sell that to a farmer? Hi, book with me, and you'll grow one-tenth you normally do. Then what do you do? You have to pay them ten times as much. The other thing is, yes? Now, when you say high chemical production, do you mean you have to put a lot of chemicals on it? Yeah, I was just uh, t talking to Jeff coming down here about this. Steve will fact check this one too. We were told by Doc uh, Doc Wilson at TRIA and Texas uh, A&M, we were told that the vector at this moment is either 21 or 22,000 pounds of rough rice, rice in the hole per acre, in chemical, high genetic, biointensive farming. Um, I saw some of the rice packed up, but when they look at metrics for feeding the world, they're going there. So when I say chemically intense, the whole idea of having chemical farming was to try to, in, to concentrate production and then avoid disease from doing it. So that you could, disease meaning plant disease, um, so that you could get more production per acre. And that's pretty much the advent of the Industrial Revolution, even though it happened before we say the Industrial Revolution started. We started um, breeding and changing things uh, in order to adapt to chemical farming, which is more nutrients at the surface, not deep, uh, short straw, so you could concentrate on grain production at the head 
and it wouldn't blow down as easily. Carolina Gold Rice, by the way, the first thing my geneticist, Santa Clung, said, McClung, when Merle introduced me to her, so why do you want to do Carolina Gold Rice? It lodges, blows down. Why would you do that? Why would you even take a crop that you have a risk of losing, right? So they blow down. So they dwarf them or semi-dwarf them. And they also shorten the roots because they don't want to put that energy into roots and stock. They want to put it into a grain head. And I think um, Steve can elaborate on that next week a lot better than I can now. But the bottom line is uh, tall straw deep roots in pre-industrial crops. And that's all Anson Mills does. And their reason was just kind of intrigued about what flavors were out there that we didn't have. Since I was a food person, worked with some of the best chefs in the United States, which is how Anson Mills got to talk to great chefs, uh, because they remembered who I was, and they didn't think I was a dummy calling up from Cisco going, hey, you want to buy a truckload of rice? Uh, I really cared about what I was doing. So I got to talk to chefs and we started talking about these flavors and they were saying, reading things where rice planters would write sonnets about their harvests. They're going, who the hell writes poems about the harvest? Well, lots of farmers, right? So I was inspired by that because the poet farmers tend to be in the sustainable movement and uh, the money farmers tend to be in debt, right? And those that can manage debt are very successful. And those that don't do that really well, don't stay in. Anybody remember this thing from Earl Butts, Get Bigger, Get Out? We're seeing another wave of that now from my point, uh, even in the sustainable world, because the scale is so tough. Um, you have a carrot nibble. We know what those are, right? The factory to produce carrot nibbles, it's like millions of square feet. It's all indoor horticulture. they got outdoor horticulture to back it up. That's where that is now. And even they can be organic, right, with millions of square feet of production for carrot nibbles. And um, I'm not taking away from that because it probably needs it. I'm concentrating on the other side of the thing. Are we missing something? So I see this big train with chemical farming going that way, going, it's great. Do it then I want to look at what we used to have to make sure we're not missing something. And at the end of this, I'll tell you why. So let's go back to the Carolina rice kitchen. What do you have to do to grow rice in South Carolina? You need salt tolerant crops because storms come into your rice fields and put salt in there. It takes seven years to get a salted field back using wash, barley trapping, and this and that and the other thing. Or you can accelerate it with really intense salt trapping where you either graze off or harvest off successive crops, you can get the rice back in three years instead of seven. So it's interesting, cattle and arrow, black kale, collards. This is interesting, salt tolerant cow peas, rice peas, right, for legumes. On and on and on. You keep looking, all of the early crops with the rice kitchen, which became part of the cuisine, collards are here, because they're salt tolerant, right? Then you're thinking, what did we need in the fields besides salt tolerant crops? Well, we're farming pretty intensely, even though it's pre-industrial. Pre so we need mean suppression. How do you do that? Now I'm really going to get in trouble. Cane have the world's foremost cane authority in the audience. Like, <laughs> we all know this, right? That's true. He's sitting right there. So you're in for a treat. Because that world, I think when I met Dr. Krasovich, he said, I'm spending my entire life with just one plant class. And you're like doing everything. But I don't have a conscience about it. Right? So I'm, all I want to do is produce good flavor. I don't have to study everything and document and peer review it. I leave it to the smart people, right? <laughs> leave it to the smart people. Ah, well, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, so canes and neem suppression. So you're going to get worms? Well, uh, let me tell you a story. My second year rice field, had I not known Merle Shepard, 
I would have committed suicide. So Clemson University is why I'm still alive today. Why? I go to my 20-acre perfect Carolina Gold rice field, which is this high with water right up to here, right? So it's six feet tall. The rice is up and just starting to bend down. And I go away. I come back six days later, and it's a mirror glass, and there's nothing out there. Nothing. Nothing. Right? Can you imagine if you got everything you own, like, into a crop, and it just goes away? I, I call it, thank God I knew Merle. I call it Merle. I said, oh, my God. I don't know what happened. The birds ate all the rice. He started laughing. He said, what? So he, he wouldn't talk to me on the phone. He said, I'll just come down there. So he's generous enough to stop what he was doing <laughs> on the rice field with Hal Hanvey, who was the tech at the time. And they were still there on the side of the field laughing because army worms had hit the field. Memes, eating all the rice. Merle said, just like grazing, it's going to get a second crop now. I said, what's that? I didn't know what a ratoon is. Anybody heard the term ratoon? You can't raise your hand. Ratoon means second rice crop. You have? Yeah. You're growing rice? Uh, yeah, yeah, cool. Same thing. Second crop. Ratoon. Is that an Indian word then, Steve? Well, I should know this. Uh, maybe I Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, i got to check it now. I have to have enough brains to remember that one. Thank you. <laughs> the army worms ate my first crop. And Merle was right. We just walked away, came back in three weeks. The rice was above the water again. Made a second crop. The army worms didn't come back. And he, he just looked at me and said, you need bean suppression. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm a damn entomologist. What's wrong with you? Worms. You've got, you have to have crops in this rotation to do nematode suppression. Well, what does it? Cane. It's one. Benny. Aha. That's a good one. That's an oil seed. African sesame. There's a rice crop rotation nobody thought about. I was using it in food plots on perimeter for pulling wildlife off of my wheat fields, right, early in the spring. So we plant Benny out there over and over again with Milo and everything else. And I'd been doing it for eight years when David said, aren't you growing a lot of Benny? I said, yeah, I got the seed from Merle. is African, right? And he said, well, have you ever made any oil or even tried to eat it? I said, no, the deer eat it all. They love it. Quail love to hang out in it. Great. The hunters come and shoot like hell. Everybody's happy. <laughs> I said, I love watching it just blow and shatter all over the field at sundown when it's really ripe because it's great to see. It just looks like a war going out there with Benny seed going everywhere. Sorry, guys. I did turn you off and you didn't go away. So, George Bush, what? <laughs> um, so, in the saga of Flavors. Uh, is anybody getting the drift here? I started with rice, collards, cow peas. Anybody remember the famous Jimmy Carter statement? We were so poor. <laughs> For breakfast, we'd have rice and peas. And then when we came back in for supper, we had a whole new dinner peas and rice. Right? Everybody know about the cast iron pea pot and has a red ring next to the rice pot. That's a real Sea Island tradition. Black, white, green, yellow, whatever. Everybody was doing it. Why do I know that? Because I grew up on that food because my mom lived on the Sea Islands on Carolina. And she cooked that way at home. And my surfing buddies, collars. I was in California. I never had one friend stay for dinner when we had collards, ever. They go, what's that? I'm out of here, right? I don't know why. Collars are great. So, you get in the drift. How does the cuisine come out of farming? It's the crops that you have to have to keep from starving to death, just for starters. It's a tilth system. It's sustainable. It does wonderful things to the soil. We stop and think about building soil. In New England, <laughs> it's really interesting it started with the Shakers, who actually don't think about legacies because they don't have conjugal relationships in that society. 
but they build soil. And the Shakers were great at building soil. They just passed it to people after they died and didn't have any children to local farmers who continued the traditions. So I learned about soil building, literally raising the level of the soil, when I was just a kid from my dad who grew up in Pennsylvania with a bunch of Amish people and spent some time in New England with the Shakers too. And we were building tilth in our garden. I always thought it was a big waste of time composting and all that stuff because uh, I wasn't thinking about what he was thinking about. But I had it in my bones that you could build soil. So when you start with the cuisine, as you build tilth, you're actually building diversity into your cuisine. And the plants are the communicators. They're telling you if you're doing right. If they're healthy, robust, they have a huge flavor profile. Any chef in the United States from the very best we know, and worldwide too, by the way, uh, from the very best we know to the casual person knows when that food hits the table, their guests have a palate reaction and they hear it back from their servers. We're in the chef business worldwide, more than 4,500. And I can guarantee you that if the flavor's there, it works. And you watch the flavor build as you put the plants together in this cuisine that actually make for good farming. So the basis is what it tastes like over here moving back to the farm, especially since we're having to rediscover what a lot of those plants were. So in this case, we're going to grain banks worldwide. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, David Shields. We have purple straw wheat in all of our seed banks in America. And it's in cement, probably in everything in Europe too. It was kind of a casual breeding stock for this and that and the other thing. But purple straw wheat wasn't really of note because it didn't have a history that said it persisted for a long, long time. Said it sort of appeared in 1822, according to the USDA records and most of the histories around. David Shields discovered that it was a robust, beautiful pastry, high protein pastry wheat prior to our revolution. And actually a whole century of presence that continued all the way to 1970 and no one knew it. It went over the divide and hid in Tennessee and Kentucky with a bunch of whiskey makers, right? Whiskey keeps old grain, right? There's a, there, we're right there, aren't we? <laughs> this is whiskey country. Um, so nobody knew it was that old. All of a sudden, now it's important because it has two and a half centuries, maybe three centuries of presence. That's strong. Purple straw wheat. Another one, Scott's Bear. Steve, you were there when Dick Shoreman came out and presented. Richard Shoreman uh, is a professor at Seattle Pacific University in a whole other field, but he grew up in eastern Washington state, and the name of their farm was Palouse Colony and his ancestors settled that farm direct from Russia. They brought their grain with them and the Hudson Bay Company supplied everything else and one of the things they supplied was English May wheat. Well, guess what happened to English May wheat here? It was here before the revolution and it went away after the revolution and the reason why it went away is because the war 1812, Europe bought it as provision for the war and they're paying huge prices. So we sent all the crop away because the prices were good. Then we set the seed too. Bang, no more English May. And we always wondered, if all the English May went away, what were we doing for pastry wheat? Nobody was talking about it. For like 100 years after the war 1812, we still had really good pastry flour down here, but nobody was identifying who was growing it or why. David looked up We found out it was purple straw wheat. We didn't care if we kept English May. We had purple straw. Yielded better, more disease resistant, better standing, better quality flour, supposedly. Haven't tried that out yet. We don't have enough. But the bottom line is, it was gone. There's two wheats in the southern canon that nobody can taste today, but hopefully they'll be able to. So, when you think about what's gone, and you start with rice, then you've got collards, peas, benny, wheat, that's the winter crop for rice field cover. Got clover out there maybe, or maybe you're growing winter legumes there too. On and on and on. And you end up with an entire set of cuisine tools 
that any good chef or home cook can pair with wild game, pigs, fish, you name it, and come up with these miraculous dishes. I think we may not get agreement for what's the core dish of the South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia cuisine across all cultures. Meat green. I like that. <laughs> what meat? And what are the other three? Just meat green. Yeah, meat and three. And that's good because there is a system that comes out of farming. Because if you look at meat and three, it's what it takes to get the meat. The three feed the meat, and you get to eat the meat. If you become vegetarian, you get to eat all three more. I don't know which way that goes. <laughs> so what does cuisine mean in farming? What does it mean for sustainability? Tilth, farming the soil, is the objective. Seed is the messenger. Get fed. Don't be fed. Get fed off the land. Feed yourself. You put seed together with these systems and tilth, you end up with beautiful food on the table. So, the Carolina Rice Kitchen, thousands of recipes of just one thing, rice bread, thousands. What was the number one staple shipping on any whaler out of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard? Number one. Think it was corn? Wheat, it was rice, number one, rice. Why? Here's a good one. In the cuisine, we as Westerners think cuisine and medicine are bifurcated. They're two separate things called the herbal and the pharmacopoeia. Those books don't talk to a whole lot about each other in Western thought until the last half century. Rice was in the pharmacopoeia prior to the Civil War. It was medicine. In the African canons, Benny was medicine. All the way through from the first leaves to the harvest. Okra and rice together were medicine. And they have their own pottery in the Catawba Nation. Do we know this? Catawba pot is for Limp and Susan, okra and rice. Those historic things we have to retain because there's a certain amount of culture that's there. So why would we keep looking when it's okay, we could go to Wendy's, this and that and the other thing. Well, they're not serving this stuff at Wendy's. Is this elite food? And the answer is, you put all these things together, and if you look at a dense acre, theoretically, where you could mix all this stuff up in the acre and then separate it later if you wanted to, or mill it all together if you're a miller and make flour out of it, like rice with cow peas, with wheat, with oats, with benny, with whatever and make a flour out of that and make bread, would that taste horrible or good? What do you think? All those together? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting though. If you ferment the peas, right? Dry them and mill them to flour, they're sweet and beautiful and they marry up really well with wheat flour. The Benny, that's really good. That's called multi-grain bread. Flaxseed, benny seed, sesame, sunflower. That's already there. So it's the leguminous, the brassicas. So we got kale bread. You could hate it or like it. There is kale bread out there, and there's a lot of people eating it. If you go down the pathways of just one food item, you can pull this tilt into it, into a cuisine. If you're thinking about farming. Can you farm all those things together? Yes or no? Have we ever done it as a civilization or any civilization since the dawn of time? Yeah. So when you say tilt, you're talking about just improving the soil health with the things that you're, yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about tilt improving the soil and improving flavor, magnetic flavor that the best chefs in the world will die for, get in line for. We're doing a little over 5 million a year now, milling about 10 tons of stuff a week. We have 400 different products to chefs worldwide, and they fight over a lot of these things because we don't have a lot of some of them because we're young. You know, 20 years is nothing in a land race development cycle. But when you're building tilth, you're building flavor. 
And in pre-industrial systems, this is peer review in the EU, and MIT is about three quarters done with this. They're making a documentary on it. They're showing that uh, high flavor in natural plant systems also is directly correlated to nutritional content of the food. When you look at that really carefully, you see flavor equals nutrition. Where did that come from? Your hunter-gatherer, if you pick up something that tastes like hell, it may kill you. You might have something that tastes really good to kill you too, but definitely if it tastes really bad, it probably is not good for you. So you don't want to go collect that one again. You keep going for something that tastes better. And if you can kind of halfway manage it, like people who migrate do, you can have better flavor from those things, and that's the beginning of farming, if you think about it. And in flavor, you do that for thousands of years, and you have the sum total of the genetics held in all of our heirloom equals land race. That's the real term we would use here. All of our land race foods. But why do we care? We can probably, we should, and we probably will get modern crops to do this. And what we're going to do is set the bar with land race crops and bring modern crops up to it. I don't want to eat Pepperidge Farm bread if I can go to an artisan bakery and get locally grown wheat loaf made there, natural event, by a good baker. I don't want to do that if I have the choice. Will I pay more? There's one. How much more? There's another one. What do you do with those ideas? You bounce them off the wall, you make a fair trade idea for community foods, and you feed yourself. You don't get fed in this community. And it's sustainable. So all these plants come together to make a cuisine, they also improve the ground. They also are healthier. They have better flavor. The only thing that's lacking here, going back to the beginning, is how do I convince a farmer to grow 700 pound an acre rice? The only way I can do that is to get an offset on winter crops where he's got 120 bushel dense acre. And the way I'm proposing for the future, which I have no peer review on yet, <laughs> Dr. Kresovitz, who will hopefully help me with this because I've been angling up to talk to him. Anyhow, it's a good pitch right now. What if I plant 20 bushel an acre wheat, turkey wheat, 1848, Kansas, Mennonite out of Crimea, has maintained the highest year-to-year -year production record, if you add it all up, of any other wheat in its neighborhood. What's its sweet spot? 10 to 30 bushels an acre. Where does it live? Somewhere between 15 and 20. So any farmer out there that wants to commit to a 15 to 20 acre bushel wheat, anybody know what the standard is for that? It's well over 200 an acre. You're not going to, no matter what premium you're paying, the guy's going to freak out just because of the plant density. You have to hold his hand through the whole thing. Or her hand, excuse me. Just both sides there. So, how do you do it? When they take turkey wheat, how about a legume at 20 bushels an acre with it? Now you've got a 40 bushel acre. What about an oil seed at 20 bushels an acre? Now you've got a 60 bushel acre. What about a brassica at 20 bushel? What about a tuber at 20 bushels? I'm up over 100. Am I making this up? No. I've done it. You know what else is fun? You can intercrop and no-till. Looks like you're tearing apart your winter planting that's happening right now when you intercrop next spring and put short crops in. So I can run tartary buckwheat in an overwinter field and harvest the tartary buckwheat at the same time I cut the emmer, the oats, the wheat, and other things if I know the days of maturity and I know what I'm doing. But when I run the no-till planter through that nice wheat, it looks like I chopped the hell out of it. Let me give you Dan Barber's latest. Anybody read Third Plate? Anybody know who Dan Barber is? Third Plate is about, Third Plate is about what do we do with food? Dan Barber is the chef at Blue Hill for Stone Barns in Blue Hill, downtown New York. Uh, he's world famous for a program which you might have heard of called Little Letters, W-A-S-T, Big Letter E-D, Waste Ed, where he's taking things that we normally throw away turning them back into food. What happens when you graze a cereal field? 
What happens to the cereal? If you flash mast it, especially how many, how many cattle people in here? When you graze it, you actually accelerate, you invigorate the crop as long as you don't let them stand there and eat the whole thing to the ground. You actually invigorate the crop. That's what the army worms did to my rice. They grazed it and it came back. You cut your lawn, the rice comes back, right? So in this case, if you plant in nice, robust, pop-up green wheat, and for a 60-day crop to get a June harvest of tartary buckwheat inside a wheat crop, it looks like you cut the field all up. The wheat comes raging back. The tartary buckwheat's just under it. You can cut the wheat high, tartary buck under it. Secondly, and you have clean harvest both ways, or you can cut them both together and make wheat and tartary buckwheat flour, which is pretty tasty. It's called ploy flour. It's one of the oldest buckwheat food ways of Western Europe, P-L-O-Y-E, of Brittany, running all the way over to Portugal. So what does this all mean? It's still a little precious, isn't it? All these old crops. What do we do with them? Why are we doing it? We don't know where the peer review is going to go on this, but I'll end with this one solid fact. Dr. Lindsay Triplett, who's a pathologist, University of Connecticut uh, ex experimental station, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, young person, for some odd reason, classically educated, but also really sort of interested in quote-unquote land race or heirloom stuff and community farming in this. She read a book by a member of our board, Dr. Richard Schultz Sr., who wrote about Carolina Gold Rice, just for grins. And in the book, she's thinking, well, it was grown by slaves. It's not African rice, it's a sativa. Carolina Gold Rice, the big engine for our export is not African, it's a sativa, so it's Asian, it's a long grain. So she had an epiphany. We've been looking, this is Lindsay Triplett saying this, we've been looking for 50 years plus for a bacterial blight resistance gene that can be applied to the African rice system in order to confront and hopefully eliminate up to 30% annual loss in African rices, which has direct associated famine with it. We can't find it in Asia. World level researchers have not found it. Lindsay just applied grade school ideas and said, I wonder if it's in Carolina Gold Rice because she read that dumb book. And guess what? She found it. That's why you do this. Back in the day, a lot of researchers weren't getting back out in the field. The guy that founded Pioneer Hybrid actually wrote a book about it called Shucks, Shocks, and Hominy Blocks. I believe it was published in the late teens, early 20s. He was the chairman, retired, of Pioneer Hybrid. And he said, my scientists aren't getting in the field enough. That's all really we're doing. We're just looking back. All scientists, like Dr. Kresovich, grow thousands of plants in the classes they're studying, thousands of distinct accessions or varieties looking for things that confront and keep us from starving to death. That's serious. So I can be a dilettante. Dr. Kresovich, if he goes away, we can starve. If I drop dead tomorrow, There'll be plenty of people carrying on my little la -dee da But the idea that a scientist can discover something because it just is there and it just connects no matter how is pretty extraordinary. And sort of justifies the 700 pounds an acre against 22,000 pound an acre experience. Now, to tell a farmer that and say, okay, you got to send your kids to college, that doesn't work. So you're paying the 700 to 22,000 an acre premium in order to get their attention. So it's not cheap, but it's worth it. That's it for me. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. The, the
don't want to go into the COVID bar itself. How did that come to be? Just kind of hybrid. I've read a lot about that period of history and culture. It's been fascinated by it, but I don't know why the British Empire was planting rice in South Carolina when they were colonizing um, India at roughly the same time, different parts of Asia. But they put it down here. The slave economy was very profitable for the Charles family to ran it. And it became this great thing, and then it disappeared, and then someone brought it back. I wanted to have like the skeleton, skeletonized or outlined. Yeah, I can, I can tell you really quickly. One, there is no true documented story of the arrival and or discovery of Carolina gold rice yet. A lot of people think it could have been a sport in a field on the East Cooper uh, for Mayhew, a guy who was a real, he beat up the local sheriff and he became really famous. He was kind of out there. Uh, he was also working with the Swamp Fox and he was a uh, major terror for the British. Um, so I guess he applied that kind of aggression to the fact that he didn't want to conform. And the rumor has it, it's not documented, we're going to do the archaeological digs with them when the rice genome, you, Steve's going out to Arizona, I don't know whether Rod Wing is in that thing, but Rod Wing is the lead geneticist for the Rice Technology Working Group as far as establishing material analytics uh, the Rice Technology Working Group is all over the southeast and elsewhere, but they collect material and it has to be developed a certain way. They're going to send it to Rod Wing, and they have decided to use Carolina Gold as the standard for that submission. Rod Wing then will use that to work up the full rice genome for that rice, and will use it as a standard. I am speaking way over my head. So again, Dr. Kresovich can fact check this because he is both collegial and knowledgeable about all those people and I'm just sitting here like a parrot. I went to the Rice Technology Working Group and I must tell you that I understood three words in five days. I just sat there like this. You know how you wake up and you're late for class, you go to class, you didn't study, you didn't do anything, and all it says, I hope nobody asks me anything. Holy crap, I couldn't believe what was going on. It's amazing. I mean, really amazing. So, to get back to your question, no one knows. And until we have the genome standard, narrow allele DNA marker analysis won't establish identity to the level of making uh, archaeological material discovery relevant and peer-reviewed. Because we already did it. Archaeological You could be amongst the first people to hear me say this in public, Dr. Susan McCooch, who used to work for Dr. Krezovich, did narrow allele vectored analysis of gold hulled rices all over the Americas and the world. She worked hard on it, but they were narrow allele. And she got these cross vector hits. She goes, whoa, Eureka, we've got an origin. Well, it's pretty much right. It's over in Indonesia somewhere. So she got to conclusive, but she can't say it with narrow, narrow allele analysis. We need a genome. So all the archaeological digs to prove where the material was are on hold, because we used to submit every year. They're on hold until the standard comes up. And we actually then can fund something that can tell us something on a peer review level that will stand up. So that's one. To do it in the public lay version of this, Carolina Gold Rice, uh, the legend, ship at sea. By the way, that applies to any kind of questionable origin, right? Uh, to a doctor, that applies to any question, this is all the same. And the doctor was benevolent and took that in payment for a sick croak. And somehow the doctor made it into this massive Carolina Gold phenomenon. That's probably a wonderful story, but the chances are almost nil that that's for real. We're pretty sure it came from somewhere. Dr. Gerdorf Kush, who was uh, foremost in uh, rice breeding at the uh, International Rice Research Institute in Erie, working with your Clemson guy, Dr. Merle Shepard, just assumed that it was Sulawesi. And we can't do any more digs until we've got the genome. And then we'll start and we'll find out. Uh, you've got hits all over Africa, the, the, and they lied about it. You want to talk about the seed trade? They lied about Carolina and Carolina from Ghana to Senegal and Senegal to Ghana. Ghana would have extra seed. They say, we have Carolina gold. They send it to Senegal. Senegal would grow it. It wasn't Carolina gold. They say, oh, we got Carolina gold. And they both find out they were doing the wrong thing. And that's been going on for 100 years plus. 
going all the way back to Brit settlement, why did they think about rice here? It was uh, a bunch of intersecting stuff between the Atlantic world and the East and how to take the European market. They, they were very selfish with this stuff. They were filling royal larders before they really went for it. And they wanted to kick the crap out of the French who had it locked up with the Italians. Uh, and it was political. Um, and our rice is, by the way, it was Italian, <laughs> you know, I think, and African before there was Carolina gold. We had 100 years of rice production before we had Carolina gold, according to almost all evidence. So we've got uh, 1748 documentation from Dr. Uh, Dr. Ross Smith, Charleston, he's a historian, and he's looked, and he's a rice historian. He sees a manifest of an entire ballast load of rice seed from the Sea Islands in Venice, uh, from the lagoon, straight to uh, Port of Charleston, 1748. That's the latest one. The next tier up is a $100,000 grant, and we're not there yet. So we're, we're working with that. That's on hold, too. Uh, but it's pretty certain that both African rices and Italian and Drayton in 1802 uh, survey of South Carolina published from work he'd been doing for a decade. Uh, in his journals, there are over 100 distinct rice varieties within the Charleston region that he identified. So it was amazingly diverse for kitchen rices, right? Not for export. We wanted to monocrop the exports. We didn't diversify until the warm-up to the Civil Wars, 1835 and on. We started to diversify, took the European market again with Charleston Long. Well, Fort Town and the Colony, I they, they took whatever they got, and whatever they got was whatever came in from everywhere around the world. Yeah. The, the so trade, the there was so much cross-trade in the Madeira trade out of Funchal, we forget how robust that was. I mean, everything was there. That's where if you wanted to take a postdoc PhD, they had all the growing zones on the terraces, and they had all the commerce in the world crossing provisioning there. It's just stunning what was going on. What was the character you mentioned at the beginning beat up the sheriff in Charleston? Uh, May Mayham. Mayham. M-A- is it M-A-H-A-N? I'm forgetting. I'm sorry. It's Mahan. Uh, East Cooper River. Road of the Swamp, swamp Fox. Anything else? Do we, are we out of time? I don't know. 